morning, everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining. Uh, this is a really great honor to have uh, two people who need no introduction, Dr. Dr. Satyan Lakshmi and Dr. Steve Atman, to speak about nitric oxide. Um, my name is Julie Uy, and online with me um, looking after this event is Rahul, our fellow. Uh, just on the screen here is our um, um, social media page. All these, um, the recordings with Dr. Atman's and Dr. Lakshmi's permission will be uploaded to our UNSW school website in due course, and I shall post it on the um, WhatsApp, WeChat, Telegram um, uh, platforms when they're available, with their permission, of course. So um, ooh, just some housekeeping rules. We're going to mute everyone. Not sure how many people will join, so don't be insulted. Um, we hope to leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end for Q&A, but uh, if you have real burning questions, uh, just type it in the chat pane or raise your hand. Um, we won't interrupt the speakers while they're speaking. Um, and uh, again, the talks will be uploaded. So if it's not in your time zone, you can access it um, whenever you're awake. So a brief um, introduction to our two esteemed speakers. Uh, everyone knows them, so I probably don't have to tell you who they are. I nicked their pictures from the web, but they're online now, as you can see, looking very glamorous and uh, in daylight. So first off, we've got Dr. Satyan Lakshmi from UC Davis in California. Uh, and then follow that with Dr. Steve Atman, uh, who's uh, he's president-elect of the APS. Congratulations. I didn't know that. Okay, we need an on-site uh, pass soon, Steve. Um, and he's from, as you know, Children's Hospital in Colorado, uh, USA. So without further ado, I shall pass it on first to Dr. Satyan. Um, and um, over to you. Thank you. Thanks, Judy. Thank you for the kind introduction. I believe Steve is already the president, right, Steve? Uh, this this year is my presidential year. Fantastic. Okay. I could claim to say I haven't been impeached yet, so we'll see. <laughs> that would be a first. <laughs> Thank you. I'll mute myself now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Julie, for the kind introduction. It's a pleasure to share this platform with uh, my guru, Steve Abman. So thank you so much for this opportunity. So we both thought we will talk about inhaled nitric oxide in the NICU. And the title was given to us by Julie from the beginning and now the end. So Steve and I have no conflict of interest and we have been funded through NIH and the American Academy of Pediatrics. So let's talk about the beginning. Um, the nitroglycerin was invented by originally synthesized by Sobrero and was used by Alfred Nobel to manufacture dynamite. In 1960, 1860s, when all the factory workers were working with dynamite, they observed two very interesting phenomena. The first phenomenon was with healthy workers. These healthy workers noticed that when they used um, when they worked in those factories on Monday morning, when they came to work, they were starting to get headaches. And these headaches now we know was from nitroglycerin fumes that led to vasodilation causing headaches. So the healthy people suffered from headaches when they came to work on Mondays. I'll let you know. On the other hand, people who were sick with coronary artery disease, when they were in the factory, they felt better because they were their chest pains were better due to nitroglycerin inhalation. But when they went home on weekends, when their wives had them to do household chores, they were getting chest pains and they were not able to work because they were missing their nitroglycerin fumes. Let's fast forward to the 1980s and we are back in Dr. Furchgott's laboratory in Brooklyn, New York. And he had two technicians who were working with vessels in vessel baths. And what he noticed was that when the more meticulous technician took vessels and put them in these vessel baths, uh, as you can see down here, when the more meticulous technician did these dissections, when they used acetylcholine, they would see a significant relaxation of these vessels. On the other hand, when a new technician came along and did a bad job of dissecting these vessels, and destroyed the endothelium, 
then while adding acetylcholine, they did not see a relaxation of these vessels. And being an astute scientist, Dr. Furchgaard figured out that the difference between these two preparations was destruction of endothelium. And he called this factor as the endothelium derived relaxing factor or EDRF. Interestingly, RF were also his initials and I guess he used that name because of that reason. So now we know that in the endothelial cell, the enzyme ENOS, endothelial nitric oxide synthase, uses the substrates L-arginine to form nitric oxide. And for example, if you have an endothelium dependent vasodilator such as acetylcholine, that goes and stimulates ENOS in the endothelium to produce nitric oxide that traverses the gap between the endothelial cell and the smooth muscle cell and acts on soluble guanyl cyclase to produce cyclic GMP. And cyclic GMP reduces the ionic cytosolic concentration of calcium and then that leads to vasodilation. Cyclic GMP is broken down by PDE5, thereby limiting its activity inside the cell. So what we were seeing in Dr. Forsgaard's preparation was that if the endothelium was destroyed, acetylcholine was not having this relaxing effect. And so he called this substance endothelium derived relaxing factor. We also know that using an inhibitor such as L-nitroarginine to inhibit ENOS by competitively blocking L-arginine led to reduction in release of nitric oxide from the endothelial cell. And we'll come to this substance also known as LNA in the next couple of slides. So the three individuals who discovered and promoted endothelium derived relaxing factor nitric oxide, uh, Robert Furchgaard, Louis Ignaro and Farid Murad, the three of them received their Nobel Prize for discovery of nitric oxide in 19. 98. And I find this very interesting that Alfred Nobel started this phenomenon with dynamite and nitroglycerin. This led to nitroglycerin use both as sublingual tablets and patches for a long period of time before you knew anything about nitric oxide. Subsequently, we figured out endothelial derived relaxing factor and the three people get a Nobel Prize. I find this to be a very interesting cycle, starting off with Dr. No Pro Nobel and then ending with the Nobel Prize. So moving forward, we are all neonatologists and pulmonologists. So let's talk about the fetal lung. As many of you know, the fetal lung is filled with fluid and the pulmonary vessels supplying the fetus are constricted. So the fetus is in a state of physiologic pulmonary hypertension. Once the baby is born, air enters the alveolus and the PaO2 increases resulting in pulmonary vasodilation. If you look at LAM models, comparing fetal life to the first 30 minutes of postnatal life, there's a modest increase in PaO2, starting with around 20 to 25 in a fetal umbilical artery, up to approximately 45 to 50 millimeters of mercury PaO2 by around 30 minutes. And this small increase in PaO2, along with allular increase in P uppercase AO2, results in reduction in pulmonary arterial pressure over the same period of time as shown by the green line here, along with an increase in pulmonary blood flow and an increase in systemic arterial pressure. So during fetal life, the PA pressure is higher than the systemic arterial pressure. And at birth, these two lines crisscross so that the systemic arterial pressure remains high way above pulmonary arterial pressure in all healthy individuals for the rest of our lives, unless we develop pulmonary hypertension. So uh, during this time, we were not really clear as to what exactly caused this pulmonary vasodilation. And uh, my co-presenter, Dr. Abman, in his lab, along with David Confield and others, devised a very interesting experiment where he took term gestation lamps and then infused these lamps with either LNA or without LNA. And LNA, as I mentioned earlier, is the inhibitor of nitric oxide synthase into the pulmonary artery of this fetus for 20 minutes before delivery and continued for 10 minutes of ventilation. And ventilation was conducted initially with 10% O2 so that the fetal PO2 would not change much and subsequently with 100% oxygen. What they noticed was really interesting. So in the lamps that got control, and the control lamps that did not receive LNA, there was a huge increase in pulmonary blood flow as was expected at birth and a further increase 
with administration of 100% O2. On the other hand, the lamps that received LNA through their pulmonary artery did not show any, an increase in uh, pulmonary blood flow, but did show an increase with 100% O2. This goes to show that the increase in pulmonary blood flow induced by ventilation was mediated through nitric oxide produced by the endothelium of these pulmonary arteries. This experiment, these two patterns of blood flow are very similar to what we see in normal transition. This is similar to the control lamps where you see an increase in pulmonary blood flow and lamps with and babies with PPHN where transition is abnormal and the fetal physiologic pulmonary hypertension persists during the postnatal life resulting in persistent pulmonary hypertension of the newborn. And this is similar to what you saw in these lamps that got LNA. We all know that PPHN leads to several changes in the cardiac uh, function, resulting in right ventricular hypertrophy and dilation, shifting of the interventricular septum towards the left, thereby compromising left ventricular preload, tricuspid regurgitation, and right to the left or bidirectional shunts at the oval foramen and also the ductus arteriosus. These are the hallmark features of PPHN in babies. Subsequently, John Kinsella, a close friend of Dr. Abman, he used inhaled nitric oxide in lamps and showed that the effect of inhaled nitric oxide was selective to pulmonary vasodilation. Here you see the pulmonary arterial pressure in black squares and aortic pressure in open squares. And you see that with the use of inhaled nitric oxide, there's a selective drop in pulmonary arterial pressure without a change in aortic pressure. And this is the so-called selective vasodilation that you see with inhaled nitric oxide. So why do you see selective vasodilation? That's because when inhaled nitric oxide enters the alveolus, we believe that it induces pulmonary vasodilation in the adjacent pulmonary vessels. But once the nitric oxide enters the blood system, it combines with hemoglobin to form methemoglobin and gets inactivated and we don't see any systemic vasodilation effects. Although more recently we are, reali we are realizing that nitric oxide does have effects on the systemic circulation as well in various ways. This is called as, this is called as the selective effect with effect limited to the pulmonary circulation. A second interesting phenomenon is the micro selective effect where nitric oxide only enters the ventilated alveolus but does not enter the non-ventilated alveolus thereby limiting vasodilation to this particular area, thereby enhancing ventilation perfusion matching. And this effect is known as the micro, so it should be selective, sorry, micro selective effect and is limited to the ventilated alveolus. For this reason, even in patients that do not have pulmonary hypertension, nitric oxide can show some increase in oxygenation and that's because it improves as ventilation perfusion matching in these, in these uh, individuals. Subsequently, several large randomized trials were done comparing placebo to inhaled nitric oxide. And here is one called as the NINO study, neonatal inhaled nitric oxide study, where they used inhaled nitric oxide along with placebo and showed that in patients with hypoxemic respiratory failure with significantly high oxygenation indices, the incidence of death or ECMO was significantly reduced from 64% to 46% with the use of nitric oxide. Interestingly, there was no difference in death and all this improvement was prominently due to the reduction in the need for ECMO in these patients. In addition, it was shown that the use of inhaled nitric oxide resulted in a significant decrease in the alveolar arterial gradient with improvement in oxygenation compared to placebo. These and many other trials led to the approval by FDA in 1999 for use of inhaled nitric oxide in the management of patients with PPHN. And the current indication we have from the FDA is for treatment of term and near-term infants greater than 34 weeks of gestation with hypoxemic respiratory failure with either clinical or echocardiographic evidence of pulmonary hypertension, where we know that nitric oxide can improve oxygenation and reduces the need for ECMO. So this is the approval that was given in 1999. And to this day, that's the only indication for which nitric oxide is officially approved. So let's look at the various approved uses of inhaled nitric oxide. And to recapitulate all of them, it's PPHN or HRF in greater than 34 week gestation infants. The time when you use or initiate inhaled nitric oxide is slightly controversial. Um, 
most places use it when a number called oxygenation index, which is a measure of severity of hypoxemic respiratory failure when this number exceeds approximately 25. Although some of the institutions, when you have echo evidence of PPHN, tend to use inhaled nitric oxide earlier at an oxygenation index of 15 or 20. Subsequently, uh, if you need more than 60% oxygen to maintain a preductal SAT of greater than 90%, then also many centers start using inhaled nitric oxide. A recent um, paper that came out with the European guidelines for management of pulmonary arterial disease stated that inhaled nitric oxide is indicated for PPHN in near-term infants and term infants to reduce their need for ECMO if the PAO2 is less than 100 millimeters of mercury while receiving 100% O2 and uh, or if the OI exceeds 25. And this got high level of evidence rating by this organization. The initial dose is around 20 parts per million. People have used anywhere from five parts to 80 parts. 20 parts provides the optimal pulmonary vasodilation along with an increase in PAO2. And increasing the dose to 80 parts per million only enhances the response in a small selected group of individuals. So most of us, initiate therapy with inhaled nitric oxide at 20 parts per million. There are a few conditions where we should exercise caution or we can al almost say that uh, inhaled nitric oxide is contraindicated and these conditions include congenital diaphragmatic hernia, left ventricular dysfunction or hyperplastic left heart with ductal dependent systemic circulation and also where the baseline methemoglobin levels are high with methemoglobinemia. Let's briefly look at uh, left ventricular dysfunction. Here is an upside down heart with the ventricles being on the top and the atria being here at the bottom. If you have evidence of left ventricular dysfunction, these patients often have elevated left atrial pressure along with pulmonary venous hypertension. And in these situations, there is exist pre-existing pulmonary edema because of pulmonary venous hypertension. In, in this condition, it's often common to see left ventricular dysfunction in patients with asphyxia with or without whole body hypothermia, in patients with diaphragmatic hernia, and also patients with sepsis. In these instances, if you use inhaled nitric oxide, you increase flooding into the pulmonary circulation by opening up the arterial side, further exacerbating pulmonary edema and causing more problems. This is almost similar to having a uh, toilet which is blocked and this blockage is the LV dysfunction. And in this case, when you use inhaled nitric oxide, it's almost like flushing the toilet, causing more and more pulmonary edema. As you can see in this graph that shows, this is a baby that we had in uh, Davis a couple of weeks back that had LV dysfunction that received inhaled nitric oxide. And you can see evidence of pulmonary edema in this patient, including a bit of pleural effusion on both sides. A more appropriate treatment here would be to use a plunger, which is known in this case, and known acts on the left ventricle and improves ventricular function and also happens to be an inodilator causing pulmonary arterial dilation. And this is thought to be a better drug in this particular condition. The second condition where we should be really cautious about using nitric oxide is any condition such as a hyperplastic left heart, which where the systemic circulation is dependent on the shunt across the ductus. Um, I have used, without having an echocardiogram during transport, I have used inhaled nitric oxide in a patient with hyperplastic left heart with disastrous consequences. So this happens in areas where access to echo is limited, especially during transport. So in this particular case, where there was a hyperplastic left heart with a hyperplastic narrow ascending aorta, there was a significant shunt across the ductus in the right to left direction, and this shunt maintain perfusion to the lower half of the body. And that's how this baby was having good perfusion. In this patient, once I administered inhaled nitric oxide to this patient, inhaled nitric oxide significantly dropped the pulmonary vascular resistance, thereby eliminating the left to right, right to left shunt across the ductus arteriosus, and thereby causing systemic oligemia and causing acidosis and anuria and renal failure. So inhaled nitric oxide drops pulmonary vascular resistance and eliminates the right to left shunt. And one, you get pulmonary edema as a consequence of this. And two, there's ischemia to systemic organs. And that's the reason why in ductal dependent systemic circulation in congenital heart disease, you should not use inhaled nitric oxide. 
And going back to the case with left ventricular dysfunction, uh, Patrick McNamara and Harish Kriplani and their colleagues in Toronto and uh, uh, London, Ontario have shown that the use of mildenone in patients who have not responded to inhaled nitric oxide can be quite effective with a significant drop in oxygenation index following the use of mildenone in these patients. So in selected patients who have not responded to inhaled nitric oxide and those with left ventricular dysfunction, intravenous mildenone can be an effective drug. Caution should be exercised because there were a couple of case reports where mildenone it was used and there was intraventricular hemorrhage observed in some patients. So it's good to obtain a head ultrasound at baseline before starting inhale intravenous mildenone. Moving forward, what can we do to enhance the effect of inhaled nitric oxide? Um, one thing to remember while managing PPHN is that getting a baseline x-ray and figuring out the lung pathology is really crucial to optimizing therapy. For example, if you have a condition where you have hyperplastic lungs, for example, congenital diaphragmatic hernia. In these patients, it's important to follow a lung protective strategy with low mean airway pressure and ventilating without causing volume trauma. On the other hand, when you have significant parenchymal lung disease, such as meconium aspiration syndrome or respiratory distress syndrome due to surfactant deficiency or pneumonia, in these areas, the strategy is for lung recruitment. And without optimally recruiting the lung, there is no benefit in administering inhaled nitric oxide. So in conditions with, high, with parenchymal lung disease, don't have PPOPhobia, use adequate PEEP and adequate mean airway pressure to open up the lung. On the other hand, when you have really small lungs, avoid volume trauma and use gentle ventilation. Even in patients with black lung PPHN without any parenchymal lung disease, and gentle ventilation appears to work much better than using very high mean airway pressure. Subsequently, once you optimize lung recruitment in these patients, then giving inhaled nitric oxide will have a much better effect. So the strategy for lung recruitment and surfactant is different when you have parenchymal disease and if you do not have parenchymal lung disease. So this was very clearly shown by John Kinsella and his colleagues. And as you can see in this graph, here the red bars indicate high frequency oscillatory ventilation, one mode of recruitment. The green bars indicate inhaled nitric oxide and the blue bars indicate patients that received both high frequency oscillatory ventilation and inhaled nitric oxide. You can see here that in patients with parenchymal lung disease with PPHN, such as meconium aspiration syndrome and RDS, the use of lung recruitment with high frequency oscillatory ventilation and inhaled nitric oxide do show an additive effect. On the other hand, when the disease is mainly vascular, such as primary PPHN without lung disease, the recruitment with high frequency oscillatory is not necessary as long as the lung is adequately open and inhaled nitric oxide is much more effective in this particular condition. And this, with this introduction, we move on to the use of surfactant because surfactant is one more way of opening up the lung more efficiently in patients with parenchymal lung disease. This slide comes from a post hoc analysis of a randomized control trial done by Ganesh Konduri and his colleagues, where they showed that early use of surfactant compared to not using surfactant resulted in significant resulted in no difference in outcome in patients with primary pulmonary hypertension or idiopathic PPHN, similar to what we saw with lung recruitment with the oscillator. On the other hand, patients that had perinatal aspiration syndrome, such as meconium aspiration syndrome, pneumonia, sepsis, or other lung diseases, in these conditions, using surfactant early on resulted in a much better outcome compared to not having surfactant. So again, similar to the use of recruitment with high frequency oscillator, use of surfactant in parenchymal lung disease causing PPHN is really beneficial. Earlier this month, Gonzalez and colleagues from Chile present, uh, published a randomized control trial in uh, Journal of Perinatology, where they showed that early use of one or two doses of Curoserve, along with inhaled nitric oxide, resulted in much better drop in oxygenation index and much better outcome compared to babies with PPHN that received inhaled nitric oxide without surfactant alone, further confirming this process.
So how does surfactant work and how do surfactant and inhaled nitric oxide show this synergy in PPHN? Let's assume this to be a patient with asymmetric lung disease. Here you have a collapsed alveolus and here you have an over distended alveolus. In this particular case, the collapsed alveolus shows signs of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction contributing to high pulmonary vascular resistance. In the over distended alveolus, there is compression of alveolar vessels and that further contributes to increased in pulmonary vascular, disease, pulmonary vascular resistance. In this particular instance, if you administer inhaled nitric oxide, inhaled nitric oxide, as I told you earlier, selectively goes to only to the open alveolus and does not enter the collapsed alveolus. And for that reason, nitric oxide tends to open up these blood vessels with slight improvement in oxygenation, as you can see here with the dotted line in controls receiving nitric oxide. But since this alveolus is over distended, the effect of nitric oxide is compromised because the vessels are compressed because of this over distension. And so the drop in pulmonary vascular resistance is not as good as it should be. On the other hand, if you use surfactant replacement and lung recruitment, all the alveoli are uniformly opened up with homogeneous lung opening. And with that, nitric oxide is more efficiently distributed and reaches its effective area target, which is the pulmonary arterioles and causes uniform pulmonary vasodilation with a decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance and a sustained and marked improvement in oxygenation. So the use of surfactant in any patients with parenchymal lung disease leading on to PPHN is very beneficial. And ideally, in my opinion, it should be done before initiation of inhaled nitric oxide. We also know that there are some patients where there is significant right ventricular dilation and dysfunction, most often seen in cases with congenital diaphragmatic hernia. And in these patients, when the RV dilation is to such a high degree and the afterload for the right ventricle is extremely high, you start seeing significant RV dysfunction. In many of these cases, the ductus starts closing and that further increases and contributes to right ventricular afterload. In these cases, a combination of inhaled nitric oxide, IV mildenone, and IV PGE1 to maintain ductal patency is effective. IV mildenone acts by enhancing the function of the right ventricle. Inhaled nitric oxide acts by reducing the pulmonary vascular resistance, and IV PGE1 opens up the ductus arteriosus, resulting in a pop-off site for reducing right ventricular afterload. And these three drugs act in synergy to improve the function of the right ventricle because a failing right ventricle is one of the common reasons why patients with PPHN require to go on ECMO. So how about the interaction between inhaled nitric oxide and oxygen? Is this marriage one that's made in heaven or one that's made in hell? I hate to sound this way, but it all depends on how much oxygen you have in the environment. That's what dictates how well this marriage will go forward. So let's assume here we have a normal pulmonary artery with an endothelial cell shown in green and a smooth muscle cell shown in brown. We know fully well that the fully coupled endothelial nitric oxide synthase produces nitric oxide, which causes smooth muscle cell relaxation. On the other hand, in PPHN, in some cases where there is a significantly hypertrophied and altered pulmonary artery, in these cases, this remodeled pulmonary artery may have endothelial nitric oxide that's completely uncoupled due to various reasons. And this uncoupled endothelial nitric oxide synthase can be an important source of production of superoxide anions. Superoxide anions and nitric oxide both are free radicals and they combine with great affinity. And when they combine with each other, create a compound called as peroxynitrate, which induces oxidative stress and is a fairly powerful pulmonary vasoconstrictor. So these three agents, nitric oxide, oxygen, and peroxynitrite are important components that dictate negative pathology resulting in pulmonary vasoconstriction in PPHN. So if, if the nitric oxide is coupled then it produces nitric oxide. If the ENOS is coupled, it produces nitric oxide. On the other hand, if the ENOS is uncoupled, it produces superoxide anions. And superoxide anions can combine with nitric oxide to produce peroxynitrate, which is really toxic. 
So in vascular biology, these three compounds, nitric oxide, superoxide anions, and peroxynitrate are called as the good, bad, and the ugly. And it's really important while managing PPHN to avoid formation of peroxynitrite in these cells. So what induces formation of superoxide anions? One common thing that we do is ventilating with extremely high concentrations of oxygen. Here is a pulmonary artery from a lamp that received 21% O2 for 30 minutes. Here is a pulmonary artery from a lamp that received 100% O2 for 30 minutes and 30 minutes of ventilation with 100% O2 is adequate to make this pulmonary arterial smooth muscles light up bright with superoxide anions. And the red dye that you see here with DHE is superoxide anions. So a short period of ventilation with hyperoxic concentrations of oxygen is adequate to increase superoxide anions within pulmonary arterial smooth muscle cells. And this superoxide anion can interfere with the function of endogenous nitric oxide. The second thing that we notice in this slide, where you see four slides showing, um, showing uh, peroxynitrate, which is seen here as 3NT in green color. What you see here is that uh, you see a pulmonary artery here really lighted up fairly brightly with peroxynitrate if you use 100% O2. If you use a combination of 100% oxygen and 20 parts per million of inhaled nitric oxide, you see a significant increase in peroxynitrate formation because nitric oxide is interacting with superoxide anions here. If you scavenge all the superoxide anions by using intratracheal recombinant human superoxide dismutase, then this signal is significantly quenched and you see a huge reduction in peroxynitrate formation. Interestingly, just weaning FiO2 to maintain preductal PaO2 in the 50 to 80 millimeters of mercury range while continuing inhaled nitric oxide is also effective in reducing 3 nitrotyrosine formation, thereby showing that weaning inspired oxygen is really, really important while managing babies with PPHN once you achieve adequate PaO2 levels, which in my opinion is something between 50 and 80 millimeters of mercury. We further went on to do some studies where we looked at initial, the effect of initial exposure to oxygen on subsequent relaxation to nitric oxide and acetylcholine. In this particular study, what we did was for around 30 minutes, we exposed these lamps to either 21% O2, 50% O2, or 100% O2 at the time of resuscitation. And subsequently, 90 minutes later, gave them either inhaled nitric oxide or intravenous acetylcholine. What we noted was that Lamps that were initially ventilated with 21% O2 had a much better response, pulmonary vasodilator response to nitric oxide and also to acetylcholine compared to lamps that received 100% O2. This goes to show that initiation of resuscitation with room air, thereby limiting oxygen exposure in these lamps led to better relaxation to inhale nitric oxide later on. So we don't care about what happens in lamps, what happens in babies? Here is an interesting bubble chart where you show the percentage of patients receiving ECMO or with the outcome of combined outcome of ECMO or death on the y-axis and the oxygenation index at the initiation of nitric oxide on the x-axis in various large randomized trials that have been conducted using inhaled nitric oxide. What you see here is that in every single study, when the initial oxygenation index at the time of initiation of nitric oxide was pretty high, the incidence of death or ECMO was high as well. And as we began improvising studies with where we started initial, initiating nitric oxide at lower and lower oxygenation indices, the percentage of patients that suffered from death or ECMO kept on going down. This graph looked pretty good till I came across a couple additional studies from Columbia where they manage patients with gentle ventilation with fairly low PaO2 levels, usually tolerating PaO2 in the 50 millimeters of mercury range. And what we saw in those studies was that even with high oxygenation indices, the incidence of ECMO or death was fairly low with gentle ventilation, as long as you tolerated PaO2 levels in the 50 millimeters of mercury range. So this goes to show that excessive exposure to hyperoxic concentrations of oxygen before initiating nitric oxide can have a detrimental effect and lead to poor outcomes.
So we not only use nitric oxide in term babies, but we are increasingly using it in preterm babies. Here is a graph from the Australia and New Zealand uh, uh, data from 2000 to 2009, where preterm babies less than 28 oh. weeks of gestation were exposed to inhaled nitric oxide quite a bit, almost similar to babies born at greater than 28 weeks of gestation. And we saw a similar, we continue to see a similar pattern between 2008 and 2017. In fact, in 2017, the percentage of babies who received inhaled nitric oxide was pretty high in the 24 to 25 week range as well, similar to what happened in babies at 37 to 30, 44 weeks of gestation. So what's all this exposure to inhaled nitric oxide doing? This is something that we don't know. And the moderator of this, uh, uh, this symposium, Dr. Julie Oi, published some very interesting results where she showed that when you look at babies with inhaled nitric oxide who are exposed to inhaled nitric oxide in the NICUs, when you looked at them, what she observed was that exposure to nitric oxide was a significant risk factor for babies developing subsequent cancer with an adjusted odds ratio of almost 16. And these are the babies that developed, 11 babies that developed um, in cancer in the first five years of follow-up and uh, Julie can further elaborate on these findings during discussion. So can inhaled NO cause cancer? That's something we don't know. It's possible that there are several things that happen in the NICU, such as phototherapy, radiation, and uh, various other factors that can cause DNA damage, resulting in mutagenic changes and malignancies. And so this is something that we need to elaborate further. But this gives us a pause for us to think about for a second before initiating nitric oxide as to whether you're putting your patients at a higher risk for cancer. But we need to figure out that just the environment in the NICU might itself, might itself be a cause for causing malignancies and not just nitric oxide. With that, I will stop and have Steve take over. Thank you, Steve.